Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. So, a massive warm welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Now, one of the many, many things I love about recording this show is busting a few myths and also giving people an insight of the tech industry, both inside and outside of Silicon Valley. Now today I want to talk a little about the booming internet in China and tell you all about the company behind the world's fourth largest search engine and that of course is Baidu. Now with the world's largest internet user population which was I think 731 million as of December 2016 and also the fact that there's a long way to go to reach as regards internet penetration levels of developed countries China's internet industry is growing in both scale and influence. Now, as more and more Chinese users come online, Baidu continues to innovate to meet their changing needs and diverse tastes. But it's not all about China. And Baidu are actually seizing tremendous opportunities to serve users outside of China in markets such as Brazil, Egypt, Indonesia, Japan, Europe and Thailand. So as a result, they're beginning to see their international products gain traction. So I wanted to find out more about those products such as the DU Do Ad platform, their screen recorder, which is a huge, huge hit all over the world. And I also wanted to find out more about that emoji app too. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to California so we can speak with Josh Fenn about how Baidu is increasing its online influence, but with exciting products beyond Baidu search engine that it's famous for. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Josh. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, hi, Neil. It's it's really a pleasure uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, so my name is Josh Fenn. I'm Senior Business Development Manager um, in Baidu Sunnyvale office in California. And uh, basically there I'm responsible for, I, I would say, bridging the U.S.-China gap for some of our international products and um, international services. Fantastic. Now, Badu does have a reputation as a leading Chinese language internet service provider that is actually aiming to make a complex world it's all simpler, all through technology. But for anyone listening that's hearing about you guys for the very first time, could you just offer a little bit of an overview and tell the listeners exactly what it is and also what problems you solve there? Oh, sure. Yeah. So there aren't actually, uh, not not necessarily too many people who know a lot about Baidu um, in the Western world, um, but we're a very big name in China. Um, so Baidu operates China's biggest search engine, um, which is the eponymous Baidu. And um, that's what it's named. Um, and now a key focus of the company is on AI-related initiatives, uh, like our autonomous vehicle platform that's called Project Apollo, um, we also are developing our own voice and image recognition tech, speech synthesis, um, and other AI initiatives like that. And uh, just to give you an idea of how this all ties in together, our search engine also uses AI now uh, to deliver more relevant search results to users. And uh, so I would say my, my teammates and I, we actually represent Baidu's global business unit. And that part of the company is more focused on bringing products and services um, uh, that are developed within China to countries outside of China. A question I feel I must ask, because we do have listeners in 165 different countries, and just to help them visualize just how big a deal Baidu is in China, do you have any stats or facts or figures about just how many people use it in China or how many searches you uh, come through the platform? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, our search engine is, of course, very big in the China market. Um, we get billions of unique queries every day, and... Uh, the lion's share of our search traffic is actually on mobile now in China. So can you tell me more about your global mobile advertising platform? Because like you say, we're in a mobile first era now, and you guys are getting more and more traffic through mobile. So how is it actually helping develop developers maximize monetization efficiency and also gross revenue too? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think it, it might be beneficial to just take um, a step backwards for a minute. So, so essentially, um, Baidu's international business is focused originally, I would say, around 2012 or so. Yeah. Um, our department, which is called Global Business Unit, um, we started uh, looking at emerging markets outside of China that are following a similar trajectory um, to, um, to China in terms of Internet development. And what I, be, what I mean by that is essentially 
these are countries that we could look at the the trends in China and we could see that they are on the same path. So relatively low but rapidly growing smartphone penetration rate. And the same follows for internet penetration. So relatively low internet penetration, maybe around um, 30 to 50 percent, but growing very rapidly. And so being in this position of um, working at a, at a large Chinese tech firm that has actually seen this growth take place within China, a country that is, that is similar uh, to some other emerging markets, um, we, could, we kind of had this crystal ball and we, we could see what's going to happen in the future. Um, or at least make a very educated guess. So based on that, um, we started developing a series of smartphone apps um, targeted at users in emerging markets. Um, utility apps, um, like uh, we have an app called Do Battery Saver, an app called Do Speed Booster. Those are for Android devices. A file manager called ES File Explorer. And a whole suite of apps similar to that um, that fall under the uh, the heading of Do Apps. That's uh, DU Apps. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the product family that we started working on, and we were able to build up a very large user base for those products um, outside of China. So hundreds of millions of users. And then um, to get back to your question about our ad platform, we this user base um, actually formed the basis of our ad platform um, outside of China. So we we developed this ad platform to help developers in China who want to reach audiences overseas and leveraging that traffic that we built up in-house. Excellent. Is that primarily used in China as well? Or do you is it used for developers uh, the other way around as well? Does it enable people in the West to uh, reach the Chinese audience or does it only work that one way? Well, yeah. I mean, you see, um, so the strategy was basically initially to build a large user base in, in countries outside of China yeah. uh, and then help um, Chinese developers do user acquisition targeted at that user base overseas. Um, but now we actually have a more robust, I would say, a mm -hmm. rounded out user base worldwide. So now we're reaching out to developers, yeah, like you said, um, in North America, in the States, in Europe, um, and other places too. And we've also started to expand our, our app family um, to focus on more like content-driven apps, um, not just utilities. So all in all, we're, we're starting to round out the offerings more. Um, working also on the, not just the, uh, you know, China to the world side, but also the world to China, like you said. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you also mentioned there you're expanding app family. So can you tell me a little bit more about Recorder, which I believe is a free stable screen recorder that captures those high quality videos online. I mean, who's that aimed at as well? Who's your prime audience there? And if you just give a brief overview of that too. Well, I mean, this is kind of uh, an interesting one because we, we launched this app in um, September 2016. Yeah. And and actually, it turned out to be super popular. Uh, this is uh, this is an audience segment that I, I wasn't even aware of at first. Um, but this is, uh, you know, for the most part, it's it's people who want to record record their screens. So this do screen recorder or do sorry, do recorder. It can um, it helps you record your screen um, and then you can also live stream from it. Um, so people will either use it for tutorials, but also, I would say, mostly to live stream mobile games. Um, so we, we initially started out by supporting live streaming to YouTube, um, but then we added Twitch, we added uh, Facebook. So if you're like a mobile gamer, um, you, essentially it's, it's completely free and you can just live stream to any of your favorite channels uh, directly from the app. Okay, I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize it was completely free as well. Yeah, completely free. And, and I mean, the interesting thing about this is, uh, like I said, we so we launched it just a little bit over a year ago, and it, it turned out to be super popular. Uh, this this app already has over 50 million users, and we're getting an average of around 4 million new users per month, and that's completely organic traffic. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? You know, something that you didn't really think would take off or... You... Uh, you, you probably underestimated a little bit, but to have 50 million users, that's phenomenal. Did that take even you by yeah. surprise? It, it, it did. <laughs> it, it did for sure. And I mean, you know, you were asking about the case studies. Like I have I have some interesting um, data yeah. or the users, I would say. So actually, we, we kind of crunched the numbers and looked at how people are using this app. Um, we found out that the number one most recorded game on Do Recorder is Minecraft Pocket Edition. Cool. And that makes up 34% of all the recorded content on the app. Um, so that just gives you maybe a better idea of, of what, you know, what the user base looks like. Yeah, is that scattered, and, is that scattered yeah. all across the world as well? Well, it's, it's most popular in uh, the U.S., yeah. in India, and Brazil. That's quite insightful, isn't it? 
Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we we definitely see a lot of um a lot of runway ahead for that that app for sure. And that, I mean that's just just one of many apps. I mean I think there's another one I read about recently called Face Emoji, which supports over thirty different languages and also provides thousands of emojis, emoticons, gifs, stickers, etc. But what's the story behind that service as well? I mean is that targeted at the younger users? Yeah, so you're right about the um, the language support. Um, it also not only supports, uh, so it supports text input for um, 30 languages, um, but it also supports uh, voice-to-text um, input. So essentially uh, dictating to the keyboard um, in English and Japanese. And uh, because this, this app, um, one of the target countries is India, we're also looking into adding um, Hindi support in 2018. To get into the, um, I guess, the background or story behind it, um, Facemoji keyboard, it was actually inspired by, or you could say kind of inspired by our keyboard app for the Japan market, uh, which is called Simiji. Simiji is, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the emoji world, but <laughs> Simiji We all, is, we is all for, talk with emojis now, don't we? There's no escaping. <laughs> yeah. There's no escaping. That's true. Yeah. No matter what platform you use, what, what app you use, it's gotta be emojis. So Facemoji keyboard, um, it was essentially inspired by Simiji. This is more of a, we call it a Kaomoji app. Yep. Um, that's um, K-A-O, Kaomoji. So that means that the emojis aren't really like images that we, you know, that you would see on, on Facebook or, um, uh, you know, the little yellow smiley faces. Um, they're made up of characters and punctuation. And it, it's a Japanese term. So Simiji was launched quite a while ago in Japan. Um, and it became the top free keyboard app in Japan um, with millions and millions of downloads. Uh, I think now we're at around 27 million. So after we launched that app, it it, it was really a tremendous success in Japan. Um, and then we decided to explore Western markets, but we needed a slightly different approach. Um, so we launched Facemoji in um, around June of 2016. And now it also has millions of downloads. So Facemoji is, is kind of like you could look at it as an emoji keyboard app uh, focused more on Western markets, whereas Simiji is for Japan. It really just seems that you guys are spinning a lot of plates at the moment and having your fingers in a lot of different tech pies, so to speak. But are there any other tech trends or tech or AI trends that really excite you at the moment in the industry? There are so many interesting things going on. It would be really hard to actually pinpoint uh, any one trend. Um, I think what's going to be exciting in, in probably the near future is when we see all these different AI technologies begin to converge in new ways. For example, we're already seeing a little bit of this, but image recognition, voice recognition, autonomous vehicles, and Internet of Things, and perhaps even AR and VR. When we start to see these things converge in meaningful ways and in ways that we can't even really predict right now, uh, that's where I think things will get exciting and, and pretty interesting. So, I mean, just to give you an example, um, this isn't even really much of a convergence of technology, but somewhere where uh, China's already making some headway and, and the U.S. and, and other uh, developed markets aren't quite there yet. So in the Baidu headquarters, um, you can actually, we have vending machines there. And some of the vending machines are outfitted with tablets, essentially iPads. You can go up to them. If you've registered your face on the system, um, you can make a purchase completely just with your face using our own facial recognition tech. You just walk up, scan your face, and your credit card is deducted. Wow, we're living in exciting times, aren't we? We really are. Yeah, it's, it's very cool. So speaking of cool things, you've mentioned quite a few tech trends that interest you you there. But, but as for Baidu, I appreciate you probably can't share too much information about what's on the horizon. But is there anything else that you can share with us about what you're excited about with Baidu? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't really be in a position to comment on, on the future of the whole company. Mm -hmm. um, but all I can say is that um, there are many exciting projects going on right now. Um, and I, I think I think people can expect to see um, exciting things in the near future. Oh, I love a good teaser. That means we're going to have to yeah. get you back on in another six months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I hope so. But before I let you go, can I just ask that you remind the listeners of where they can find you guys online, find out more information about some of the apps that we've talked about, and also just reach out to a member of your team if they've got any questions after listening to our conversation today. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you can follow our Twitter account at um, it's at. Baidu Mobile, that's B-A-I-D-U Mobile. 
Um, we also have um, a Facebook page that's Baidu Mobile Apps. And people can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, my name is Josh Fenn, J-O-S-H-F-E-N-N. Well, one of the things I love doing about this show is I always say at the end of every episode that technology works best when it brings people together. Now, although you're famed for being a huge company in China, or should I say Baidu's name uh, is famous for being a big name in China, I love how through your apps and through your various different technologies, you've mentioned a few countries and continents there, such as Brazil, India, China, Europe, Japan, and the US, and you're bringing people together through those technology and those solutions. So I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing that story with us today. Thank you. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks so much, Neil. Now, Josh is responsible for driving demand and supply-side partnerships for Baidu's global ad platform. But he also manages Android, iOS developer relationships, all from that California office there. But it's how he's actually helping bridging their US and Chinese teams on the international business strategy that really intrigues and excites me. Because despite what we read in the daily news, my big takeaway from what Baidu are doing here, especially with all the Do apps, is Baidu is aiming to make a complex world simpler all through technology. And that is the exciting part of today's story for me, because what really excites me too at the moment is that technology is quickly becoming invisible. And it all just happens seamlessly without us having to question or learn how to work or use something. And technology, as I always say, really does work best when it brings people together. And the fact that Baidu is working with Brazil, India, China, Europe, Japan and so many different countries and continents is incredibly exciting. But I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. If we do have any people listening in China, I'd particularly love to hear your views as well. And you can share your stories, your insights by tweeting me at Neil C. Hughes, emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com or just pop by my website techblogwriter.co.uk where you can find out more details on today's guest and every other one of our 504 episodes, I think it is now. But I'm afraid that's it. I'm out of time. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.